Hello again Scotland fans and we're back for our second Q&A video actually so we're going to be talking about some of the frequently asked questions that we as travel writers that go around Scotland all the time get asked. Hopefully it'll be useful in your own travel planning because it's that time of year when you're starting to think about big adventures that you can have and some of the questions that we've had in the first series were our most common ones but we're now breaking into slightly different niches so we're going to dive straight in and talk about Outlander because it's the show that brings more people here than any other. It's a massive part of the tourism industry yes. here. Um, you know, when you do what we do as well, you almost feel sort of obligated to keep up with it as well. <laughs> you, do. You, do. Um, you know, because so many people are asking about it, and it is something which has engaged hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world in Scotland's story. You yeah. know, so from that perspective, you know, certainly view it as a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are probably wondering, um, you know, if you are into Outlander, what's the best way to actually go about that yes. when you are travelling to Scotland? Because there's so much you could potentially do around that theme. And they did almost all of their filming in Scotland, so there's so many filming mm -hmm. locations you can visit, whether that's battle sites, castles, coastal locations, city locations, it's fantastic. Yeah, so someone is asking if they had four days to spend, they've only got four days in Scotland, but they want to make it an Outlander themed trip, mm -hmm. where would they go? Well, I think if you've got four days, um, it's very tempting. Um, if you've got a couple days, you know, better part of a week to think, oh, I can do loads in Scotland. I'll be able to crisscross the country, no problem. You're going to have a bit of a trade-off. It's, it's a big country for a wee country, mm -hmm. as we say. So <laughs> yeah. if you want to do certain sites, and if you're an Outlander fan, you might want to go to a Culloden or a Glencoe. These are pivotal parts of the Outlander story, and the Jamie Fraser story in particular, with the Jacobite connection. But if you're looking to tick off several big attractions, the areas to hit, mm -hmm. generally the Lothians, yeah. Glasgow, Ayrshire, and Fife. So a potential route to do, you know, if you're thinking of starting somewhere like Edinburgh, which a lot of people do, um, there are several locations right in Edinburgh. You've got Bakehouse Close, for instance, where Jamie had his print shop. Um, Craig Miller Castle in the south end of the city mm -hmm. um, featured quite heavily as well, not only in Outlander, but also yeah. in quite a few other feature films. Uh, Mary Queen of Scots, Outlaw King, so it's you know, sort of multiple in one. Um, going from Edinburgh, probably best to head across the bridge to Fife. Yep, um, sure. There's loads over in Fife. Uh, Falkland is of unmissable. Yep. That, of course, stood in for the 1940s Inverness. Yes. Um, you have got uh, Curis as oh, well, yeah. uh, the Royal Borough of Curis, which is one of the most charming places, I think, in definitely, Scotland. It's definitely. magnificent. Um, you'll recognise that right away as uh, Cranesmuir, so there's loads of locations you will recognise straight away when you drop into Curis. Mm -hmm. um, then probably just sort of head west to Dune Castle, which is, of course is Castle Leoch. Um, from there you can go yeah, sort of southwest towards Glasgow, head yep. at Glasgow Cathedral, yep. uh, maybe pop down as far as somewhere like Dunur Castle yep. um, in Ayrshire, Ayrshire yeah. and then sort of work your way back through sort of the Falkirk and West Lothian area. Mm -hmm. um, you can then hit that great cluster where you've got within a few miles of each other Midhope Castle, which is Lallybroch, yeah. um, Black Ness Castle, where Jamie was horrendously tortured, <laughs> uh, you know, several other country parks and estates. Um, yeah. So that sort of Outlander Central right there, and then you're just on the doorstep of Edinburgh again. So if you maybe do yeah. a day in Fife, um, a day in sort of a you know Stirling Falkirk yeah. area, a day over in Glasgow and Ayrshire, and then a day just to sort of wrap things up. Yep. Yeah. That would probably be a good that's way to spend four days. Four days, and you can probably get at least a dozen attractions in, I would think. Easy. In these yeah. days. As I say, you could also go plan B and go up to the Highlands, but you're at that point looking at only doing two or three, I think, attractions, which <laughs> may be important to you or may not. But entirely up to you. Both would make for a great time. Good answer, I think. Yeah. So we're now uh, question two. Mm -hmm. And the big question is Scotland on a budget. How do we do Scotland on a budget? It is tricky, uh, i got to confess. Um, there's a few things you can do. I mean, just generally being prepared in advance, you know, is something that we recommended in the last mm -hmm. Q&A, mm -hmm. um, not least because places can get booked up very quickly. Yeah. Um, so do your homework. Um, it is perfectly possible to find uh, B&Bs and hotels and things like that accommodation for reasonably cheap mm -hmm. uh, not dirt cheap unless you want to go the hostel route and there are tons of hostels in Scotland yes. um, yeah. I've stayed in quite a few of them um, the, you know the hostel experience can put a lot of people off but um, a lot of them actually have things like single rooms so you don't have to be in a, you know in a bunk room with eight mm -hmm. other people putting yeah. up with snorers and all that kind of stuff um, so hostels are certainly a way to cut down on that um, public transport bus fare um, even sort of like the city link coaches and things like that yep yeah. 
tends to be reasonably affordable. Bus, yeah, buses are pretty good. Trains yeah. can be good, but they can also be extremely expensive. Train tickets bought yeah. significantly in advance can be um, relatively cheap, um, but bought sort of you know on the day of or even a few days prior can be very expensive. We're talking yes. you know fifty pounds for a single ticket from Edinburgh to Inverness, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so. That kind of brings us on to a challenge, actually, because... It does. So, looking at the different ways to travel, um, yeah. and, and flying, we've not touched on flying yet, so if you're mm. getting, we don't, well, as green people, green-minded people, we're not recommending flying within yeah. within Scotland, but if you were to do that, you're looking at huge prices as well, to go to somewhere like Orkney or Shetland, mm. or to the Western Isles. Hundreds of pounds, easily. Yes, yeah. hundreds of pounds, which, which we've always laughed about, and people in Scotland will always say, well, I can spend that money yeah. and go to, to go to the Far East, or to go to North America, yeah. or different parts of the continent. In the southern Europe, for example, for the same price, if not less. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big disincentive to fly, which is. in one way is a, is a good thing environmentally, mm -hmm. but it puts a lot of people off if they're trying to do a lot of things mm -hmm. and looking at the road routes and thinking, that's going to take me ages. Overall, don't expect to travel Scotland cheaply, no, I would it's say. It's just not cheap. Yeah. F ferry fares tend to be not too bad. Fuel prices aren't that bad, probably should be higher. Um, if you're a camper, obviously you can save money by, by camping, yeah. but they'd have to have the gear with you. So we would understand, if you'd have to rent gear here, which, which clocks up costs, and of mm -hmm. course you don't know, necessarily know where to camp, and it becomes a huge research exercise. So bottom line, we understand your pain. It's yeah. common, isn't cheap. Exactly. Same for us as you. Yeah. That's good. Next now, uh, yeah, th there's an interesting question we got, sort of talking about um, the historical legacy of one of the most well-known but also controversial figures in Scotland's story, mm -hmm. and that's Mary Queen of Scots. So, I yeah. um, had a question, you know, fundamentally, you know, was she kind of a, a goodie or a baddie? Did she rule Scotland as her people wanted her to, um, or did she kind of do what she wanted? What, mm -hmm. you know, growing up with the Scottish educational system, yeah. I'm interested because, you know, I'm obviously coming from Canada, I've lived here for a decade, but I didn't grow up in the Scottish school system. What's the picture that gets painted of Mary? She is, she's the most famous woman in Scottish history, mm -hmm. so I think she's generally looked on quite favourably, obviously she met a grisly end, mm -hmm. as, as all famous people in Scotland seem to do. <laughs> yeah. um, Very few die peacefully exactly, in their beds, it must be said. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, but I think from, from, what, from what we've taken out of it, she's just had such a difficult life. Yeah. Um, she almost had no way of winning. She was dealing with Scotland that was going through a tumultuous change, particularly in terms of religion, mm -hmm. the Catholic Protestant divine, being a Catholic side, coming from the Stuart side of things to a country that was dealing with John Knox and, and all sorts of religious revolution. Mm -hmm. um, she was dealing with something very, very delicate there. And yeah. how can you win? Especially as she, she grew up in France most of the time. Was, yeah. was getting She had no family background, no stable family background or parents that she could look to for easing her into this role. It's not yeah. like the current one. No real like anchor to ground her. You know? no. She was very much sort of having to do the best that she could mm -hmm. while facing almost constantly changing and tumultuous circumstances. Yeah. And you mentioned John Knox, for mm -hmm. instance. I mean, we intertwine sort of, you know, the religious tension because Mary was Catholic and Scotland um, during her reign was moving increasingly, increasingly towards Protestantism. Um, John Knox was a very outspoken foe of Mary Queen of Scots, going so far as to quite vividly describe aspects of her sexuality, for instance, and criticize her for the kinds of things that men have always criticized powerful women for. Um, mm. So there's a lot of misogyny yes. dealing with the legacy of Mary Queen of Scots as well. Um, my personal perspective is that um, no, she did not um, sort of go against the wishes of her people because, you know, how, how do you measure that? If you want to talk about Scottish kings and rulers mm. who did what their people wanted, you have very few examples to work with, actually. Yeah. You know, so yeah. if this is an allegation that's levied at Mary that, you know, she didn't do what her people wanted, we must equally apply that criticism to almost every ruler that Scotland has True. ever had, you know. Um, but she was, you know, a, a woman in an overwhelmingly male dominant world, uh, you know, a Catholic and increasingly Protestant Scotland, um, and you could say sort of a, a romantic and, and a lover in quite a harsh, uncompromising brutal yeah. world as well. She did make some daft decisions, yes. absolutely. Choice um, of husbands. Yeah, marrying yeah. the guy 
who was widely yeah. believed to have murdered your second husband is probably not the best PR move. Um, so certainly she didn't make life easy for herself with some of her choices. But I certainly wouldn't go so far as to say that she was you know, sort of adversarial to Scotland's interests, not in the least. Um, it was probably a no-win situation yeah. for Mary, given the politics at the time. Yeah. So I think a, a troubled personality, but certainly doing the best she could within those circumstances. Yeah, agreed. And if you're a Mary Queen of Scots fan, you can go to many sites around Scotland. She's been to almost all of her castles and palaces. <laughs> yeah. Some of the best ones include Lanlithgow Palace, which we've talked about in a previous video. Um, well, Cleveland Castle was another cracker. Of course. Yeah, she was in prison there. Um, That's um, where she found out that her son, uh, yes. James the Sixth, had yes. been made king, and there yes. was a, a fireworks display and a party while she was in the prison cell. Um, so that must have not been a very happy night for her. Oh. Um, yes. There's um, in Jedburgh as well a few locations associated with Mary Queen of Scots. Hermitage Castle is where mm -hmm. she rode mm -hmm. to Lord Bothwell's aid after yes. he'd, been, he'd been attacked by a reaver. Uh, her famous sort of night journey, twenty-five miles each way over the moors. Um, I mean, what a woman. I mean, how many people would go to those lengths, you know, for the person they love? Not many when you're looking at the historical record. She's not our most famous female for nothing. Exactly. Know. Yeah. Okay, now, next up. This one is definitely Neil's territory. I've bagged a few Munros. Um, mm -hmm. Considering I busted my knee coming down Ben Nevis, I probably shouldn't be giving any advice when it comes to doing this. Um, so we had a question about um, what are some good Munros to bag, um, how to get to them, and um, what about climbing them and just generally travelling in Scotland with a dog? Okay. Um, Okay, Munro is a hill over 3,000 feet. Uh, we have many, many of them around Scotland. Uh, as soon as you get to the Highlands, they start popping up all over the place. The most po common starting point, without doubt, is Ben Lomond, yeah. just north of Glasgow. Um, I think the vast majority of people who are looking to Munro bag and, and take them all on, uh, start there. So that's probably a, an easy starting route. It's, it's a very, very straight and gradual route up. If you're looking for something a bit more original, perhaps, you could be looking at somewhere like a Ben Cruachan in Argyll, which is, again, a great day trip from, from the central belt. Really good um, to access by public transport as well, yes. because you can take the train yes. line out to Oban, um, and a few stops before Oban um, is, I believe, the stop is Falls of Cruachan, yeah. um, and you can just hop off the train, and literally the trail up to the Munro starts yeah. from exactly. the station. That's yeah. what I did, and it was a brilliant in time. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's another fabulous one. Um, Argyle is full of them, Persia is full of them, Glencoe, I mean there's so many in Glencoe, you could be there for yeah. weeks exploring <laughs> Glencoe's Monroe's. Uh, but you don't necessarily always need to do a Monroe, there's a kind of slight snobbishness about, oh I need yeah. to do a Monroe, but actually some of Scotland's best hills are not Monroe's because they don't quite meet that height threshold. Mm -hmm. So you get heights like at Ben Arthur which is extremely popular, Sullivan and Sutherland is one of the iconic hills of Scotland, it's not a Monroe. Even um, just in the local hills, you got um, places yes. like Dunayat, which is an old yes. fort, yes. Um, yeah. right up, you know, on the edge of sort of the Oakle Hills when it slopes down into the Stirling area. Yeah. Magnificent views of one of the most historically significant areas of Scotland, yeah. um, and you know, wouldn't take more than forty-five minutes to reach from where you can pull over on the road and park your car. Precisely. So, so many options that are not so not so difficult to reach. Some are more remote than others. Of course, talked about logistics. Some of the hills in the islands, if you're in Mull or Sky or the Irish Hebrides, some very remote hills there. Yeah. Um, so you're quite logistically facing a challenge. The easier ones, as I say, um, Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park and Persia for the Central Belt. If you're in Aberdeenshire, maybe you could be looking at moving to the Cairngorms, but they're quite difficult hills. Very, very high up. So some of the highest peaks in Britain, five of the top six, I think, are wow. in the Cairngorms, and it's very, very cold up there. Yeah. So. Logistically, you probably want to go somewhere where you've got an easy access to a city as a base. As for dog travel, um, not being a dog owner, I'm not hugely sure, but I do see a lot of dogs on the hills, and as long as they're on a leash, I mean, you do get sheep on a lot of Scotland hills, that's a thing to bear in mind. So they probably need to be on a leash unless they're very well behaved. Um, but generally, Scotland has a right to roam. So as long as you leave the land as you find it, there are very little limitations. It's one of my favourite things about Scotland is the right yeah. to roam. I mean, coming from Canada, where, you know, if there's a fence, don't you dare be on the other side of it. Or if there's a road that says private, you know, mm. if you go down there, someone's calling the police. Here it's like, am I trampling a farmer's crops? No. Yeah. Am I bugging anyone? No. On you go. Yeah. It's great. Nothing you yeah, can do. Yeah. yeah. So just always be responsible, of course. Yeah. Um, and considerate, importantly. Yeah, um, Scotland generally is very dog friendly, uh, more so in the cities and in rural areas, but in the cities, um, there are so many, you know, even restaurants, uh, pubs 
cafes, shops, many of them are dog friendly. Um, so generally speaking, it's quite easy to have a dog um, and live as well as travel in Scotland. Yeah, super. Okay, uh, time for maybe one more question. Time's ticking all of that. So, driving. Yeah, this is something that is probably um, one of the bigger challenges for people visiting Scotland. If you are going to rent a car, there are a lot of things to bear in mind. Um, remember, it's on the left side of the road here, so that's one of the biggest things for people to come to grips with. Now, I'm not a driver. I go everywhere by public transport and cycling, but Neil has tons of experience mm. uh, driving in Scotland. Yeah. So what would you yeah. say are some of the most important things to bear in mind? Uh, so very easy to hire a car in, in Scotland. Um, you can do that at the airports, around the cities, locations around the country. So that's not difficult. If you've never driven on the wrong side of the road before, uh, I would avoid the cities and towns. And I, I generally don't drive inside the towns anyway, just I don't think it's necessary. If you're in the central belt, trains can get you between these locations very easily. You don't have to worry about parking. It's a nuisance. You don't need to bother with that. But if you're going to the highlands and islands, a car can be very advantageous. Um, especially if the weather isn't great and you could be stranded with one bus a day and uh, it can yeah. very much dictate the rest of your itinerary so the freedom to have a car can be a really good thing in our more remote areas um, in terms of the driving itself up north you're not going to face many difficulties the roads are crystal clear mm. um, you know where you're going if you've got sat nav even better that'll guide you but you can't really get that far lost the only difficulty maybe is with single track roads mm -hmm. where you're, you're having to deal with a different rule of the road which is passing places where you move into the passing place and let other cars come to you so there may be stops and starts that come with that if it's, it's just simply to deal with a single track road yeah. so that means you need to be confident of being able to reverse for instance yeah. Um, yeah. which if you have a large vehicle like a camper van for instance yeah. um, and if that's your first time driving a vehicle like that can yeah. present a real challenge and yeah. one thing to bear in mind as well um, I'm having flashbacks now to when my old brother came over and uh, we were driving along the road on the west flank of Loch Lomond um, and we ever so slightly went off sort of the side of the road just ever so slightly into a pothole popped a tire um, largely because relative to roads in places like Canada and the United States mm -hmm. um, the roads here tend to be quite narrow mm -hmm. um, don't expect the big broad avenues of you know American motorways for instance mm -hmm. um, oftentimes from my experience as a passenger in cars anyway in Scotland it often feels like when a car passes you on the other side of the road it's like Oh, I thought we were going to hit him. <laughs> you know, it's like there's very little clearance. Um, so that might be something that does take some getting used to, um, as well as just sort of making sure that you're not drifting too far over to the side um, because you probably won't be used to driving on the left-hand side. Yeah. So I know that's something that visiting drivers have, ha have had some difficulty mm -hmm. with. Yeah, um, especially awareness. Yeah. Which probably means that unless you absolutely have to, um, it's better to go with a smaller vehicle than mm -hmm. a large one, I yeah. would say, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, certainly, if you're easing yourself in, that, that's very much the way to go. Mm -hmm. Just roundabouts, that's the other thing we do. A huge yeah. amount of roundabouts, probably it's almost anywhere else. Um, so if you're, you're coming up to a roundabout, just remember you're looking at what's happening to your right. What's happening to your left is not so much of a problem, but again, you're on the wrong side of the road. So not only are you driving on the, on the left, you're also having to pay very much attention to what's coming from this side rather than that side. So psychologically, that's possibly a, an area that could be tricky yeah. to adjust to. But driving, comparing Scotland with somewhere like um, continental Europe, even even parts of northern continental Europe like um, Belgium or France, where the, the traffic is insane, everyone is incredibly rude. And um, <laughs> you go somewhere like Italy and Palermo or something like that in southern Italy, taking your life in your hands. Total yeah. chaos. We don't do that much. Extremely polite by by most standards in terms of our driving. Yeah, we only honk or horns if it's like a last resort. So yeah. In other countries, it's constant. It's every little thing. If you honk your horn here, it's like a declaration of war. Like oh, you're yeah. in business. Someone honks their horn out <laughs> the window, and I'm going out to see yeah. like, what drama is unfolding. You know, yeah, exactly. One other final note is that if you're coming from North America, a lot of people expect automatic cars to be the norm. Mm. That isn't the case. They tend to be manual. You can get automatic cars, but it's something you may have to request in advance. Good point. Yeah. So I think that pretty well brings us to an end for this Q and A session. Uh, we've done so many questions piling in, which yeah. is great. Um, we're going to do our very best um, to continue this series and give you some insights from our extensive experience of the best and you know the less ideal things to do when you're traveling in Scotland. Um, so feel free to get in touch, leave comments on this video, even drop us a line through the Scotlanders and our individual social media accounts. Um, if there is anything you're curious about, we will do our very best to make sure that you know the answers and make the absolute most of your time in Scotland. That's what we're here for. See you Cheers. next time.